Hello Omaha and welcome back to Keep Moving Forward, a table talk for the City of Omaha Human Rights and Relations Department. I'm Laura Aite. And I'm Laurie O'Brien. Our department has been tasked in part with enforcing federal and local anti-discrimination laws that protect individuals from discrimination in housing, employment, and places of a public accommodation. If you believe you experienced discrimination or simply want or need more information on your employment and housing rights, please contact our office at 402-444-5055 or visit our website at humanrights.cityofomaha.org. Thank you for joining us last week when we discussed uh, the history of fair housing in America. And I'm excited to introduce our guest today, our colleague and program administrator for the City of Omaha uh, Economic Ec Equity and Inclusion Program. Please welcome to our show, Jared Anderson. Thank you for having me. Welcome, Jared. We'll just call it EIP for <laughs> yeah. now. That's a EIP. Mouthful. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's much easier to say. We'll <laughs> go that one a little bit. So, <laughs> welcome, Jared. We're excited to have you today. Well, thanks for having me. So, could you just kind of start by telling us the function of your position within our department? Yeah, absolutely. So, in relation to contracts with the City of Omaha, there's the engineering or consulting contracts, and then there's construction contracts. The larger contracts um, require the EEIP plans be submitted by the, the awarding or the awardee, so whatever contractor wins or whatever engineering firm um, turns in the proposal that's chosen. So for consulting, anything over $100,000 for a project, and for construction, anything over $500,000. My job is to walk them through how to design their annual economic equity and inclusion plan, and then kind of enforce what the substantial but realistic means for that company. So I have to kind of investigate their size, what kind of resources they might have, talk to them about what they're already doing, and come up with a way for them to design a plan that meets the requirements of the ordinance for um, basically reaching out to small emerging businesses, uh, workforce development for working age students and adults, and then youth engagement. And these are all supposed to be focused on tier one areas in Omaha, which are areas that have um, due to census tract data, indicate there's 30% or more um, poverty levels. So that's kind of the nutshell. Um, I get to work with them on a lot of other things with, or, you know, surrounding apprenticeships. Yeah. Um, anything that feeds into those three components. Well, Joe, do you mind just kind of going over your background and your experience and how you got sure. into this first? How I got the job was kind of, um, well, it was a blessing, but it wasn't something I necessarily expected. <laughs> um, I, my background is I have a master's degree and then I have a degree in psychology. Hmm. And when I originally went to school, I wanted to go and be you know, a research psychologist, psychiatrist. Um, found out very quickly with the job market and the Great Recession <laughs> back in 2008-9 that that was going to be really hard to mm -hmm. make any money. So yeah. I did the MBA thing instead yeah. and started looking into human resources. Mm -hmm. um, the psychology aspect kind of fed into yeah. that. My wife and I also have a couple of businesses that we started around that time. So the business development side was something I took into my jobs at the time and helped develop a couple of small companies, um, basically through the human resources hat, but I wore like an operations hat and a foreman hat in the construction company um, and learned to just kind of build the companies up with their morale, with their processes, with their uh, revenue streams and lots of different things that kind of come into like the whole big picture of it. And when I saw this job, um, I saw the small emerging business part mm -hmm. of it and I was, I was kind of really zoned into that. Um, I didn't know exactly what the EIP was at the time, right. um, but the small business development part caught my eye and so I applied and that was what I kind of focused on um, when I came into the position and then I decided, okay, we have these other youth and we have the workforce parts. So I took some of what I did before in human resources and some other jobs um, to try and kind of get to the people that were making the plans, which right. are usually human resources managers, um, if it's not the owner. And I could kind of speak their language. So it was something to help make the program more impactful. So I, I started focusing on the workforce and the, the youth parts a little bit more. Um, the SAV part's still always gonna be a huge part and that's what draw, you know, drew me in. Right to the position and made me want to apply for it and ultimately try and work towards. But um, that's kind of my background, a um, couple businesses, love entrepreneurship. 
um, love small business development. I've always had kind of a, an underdog spirit. So if there are underutilized mm -hmm. businesses or people that are being overlooked or, you know, kind of the diamond in the rough type of story, you know, yeah. find the rock stars that just don't get the chance. This program helps to kind of enforce some of the bigger players in the city yes. to do get that. Yes. And I get to, in a kind of indirect way, advocate for them by encouraging the companies to do more. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, and I can see that would be a good fit for you. Yeah. Yes. And so you kind of mentioned you work, you came on and tried to develop the workforce and youth. Now, is that the apprenticeship part of the EEIP? Yep. Um, and that kind of crosses over to both components, depending on how a company designs it. But yes, the workforce piece um, coming in, apprenticeships are, I mean, when there's skilled labor shortages, there's mm -hmm. kind of a buzzword for a long time now. Um, and the city didn't have anything specifically addressing apprenticeships at all. Um, so we were able to kind of help develop an incentive for the contractors to utilize the apprenticeships. But building up to that was more or less, how do you get the kids that are in you know, Omaha Public Schools, all the different school districts, to start throwing the information out there and saying, hey, college is a fantastic opportunity. I mean, I spent a lot of time there. But <laughs> there's also another path. If college isn't for you, where mm -hmm. you have skills in the trades, you should be able to at least have that as a choice, yes. as a different pathway that can take you to, honestly, sometimes more successful Absolutely. job placement earlier. Right. So. Yeah, sure. And I know sometimes we focus on four-year colleges for students, but that's not always a right pathway for students. Right. There could be family, you know, cost prohibitive things going on. There could be testing that doesn't meet the, you know, the criteria to get into certain schools. Whereas with apprenticeship programs, they're designed specifically for the individual to know where they're going to start, where they can finish, and exactly what they need to focus on and be proficient and then beyond proficient in in order to be certified and to become a journeyman ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and the pay, I mean, you, you get to earn money while yes. you learn. You earn while you learn. Mm -hmm. right. So if you do come from a tier one area, for example, um, and you get into these pathways in high school and you're introduced to them when you turn 18, you're free from the OSHA wow. laws to operate yes. machinery and everything. You can go to some of these companies that have developed the pipelines and you can start making more money than I make. Right. I mean, there's a couple yeah. of people that have gone through that I know for sure from Omaha South and they make really good money for where they're at and that can be ultimately the economic deciding factor like for generational change. Absolutely. Or, well, I would hope. Well, Not absolutely. always, but yeah. that's a possibility. Well, it's nice to have that choice. Yeah, absolutely. Right, yeah. And what um, fields or trades do you see the apprenticeships um, developing in most? Well, you're going to always see the most in like your electricians, your plumbers, the t you know traditional um, union shop type of is what I call them union shops. Um, we actually do now in Nebraska have a construction craft worker registered apprenticeship with the Department of Labor, first of its kind in this region. Um, so now there's actually specifically for kind of your entry level construction oriented person that wants to get in doesn't maybe know a ton. But let's say they went to the career center at OPS and they have like their OSHA 10 card and they know some basic framing. They know how to use a tape measure. Mm -hmm. They know the basics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they can get into this apprenticeship program and instead of looking at it from, uh, you know, I'm going to just go to whatever company each year pays me a dollar more, mm -hmm. they can see the end game now that if I stay with this company, not only will I get more money, but I can see where my responsibilities and my proficiencies will go. Um, I don't know if that answers your question completely, but the construction thing is really blossoming. The engineering and that whole side, there's kind of a, internships and apprenticeships can be very similar, yes. okay? Mm -hmm. In my opinion. Um, there are a lot of agencies in Omaha, like Avenue Scholars, for example, that work more or less on both. But when we talk to agencies like that, that do kind of the internship model for the engineering firms, you look at exactly what they're lining out, and it's pretty much the same type of model as an apprenticeship. Now, there are options. The federal government did some things to kind of um, make it more advantageous to do things in engineering firms, too, as far as apprenticeship, registered apprenticeships go. Um, so that's starting to pick up steam. But I would say construction is probably the big one. There's not enough workers. There's people that 
want to go where they make the most money, and if they know they have an opportunity, or, or guys and gals coming out of, um, you know, formerly incarcerated, coming mm -hmm. out of um, yes. justice system, this is a really great path for them because there are a lot of engineering jobs, for example, where human resources policies prohibit them for their felonies, things like that. Um, so construction is really kind of a, a big opportunity right now that's starting to get noticed. That's great. So you really help, you know, a wide variety of people and people that might have barriers to employment right. and um, really can impact them for the rest of their lives, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And some of these apprenticeship programs are typically male-oriented programs. Do you see it changing? There are a lot more um, female workers Good. in construction than yeah. there ever have been from Good. what I understand. I'm, I'm going to be honest though, it's still dominated by males and um, you know we have some companies that work with the city a lot that are actually owned by females and they're kind of leading the charge to you know make it a more equal chance or opportunity for whether you're a guy or a gal you can actually get into this. I think that it's going to be more than a few years before we see sure. it kind of equal out to be honest. Sure. Sure. But if you start with the youth again, right. and you start right. teaching you know, girls and women in high school, this is a chance to go where you want to go financially maybe. Yes. Or you can do this until you decide what you really want to do for college and then you go to school. This could be a great opportunity because right. once you get into the apprenticeship programs, it's structured. It yes. does not matter whether you're a guy or a gal, right. you're going to get paid the same rate based on how many hours what your skills that you met, you know, the, the tests basically, and that's what you'll get. So as far as the, what we see in some other sectors or whatever, mm -hmm. where there's really big differences between mm -hmm. male and female wages, there's, you kind of eliminate that subjectivity when you have a, an apprenticeship model. That's wonderful. Good point. Which is nice. That's yeah. wonderful. So it has the potential to be a really right. useful tool. And that's, that's important. That's great. Yeah. Really exciting. And the apprenticeship program and the EEIP program are fairly new to the city of Omaha, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, the EEIP started out in 2015. Okay. So Nebraska abolished affirmative action. There were a couple of council members, council member Jerem and council member Gray, mm -hmm. who got together. And there were projects going on at the time where in, in North Omaha, so it's a tier one area. And they were driving through these areas and they got a lot of feedback from the community that says, hey, why do you have all these people working on these jobs? We have people here that can do them. They're skilled, they're, you know, they're licensed, whatever it might mm -hmm. be to do those jobs, but they're not getting a fair look. Um, the companies that were getting the projects weren't subcontracting, for example, some of the companies out there as much. Um, so in 2015, they adopted a resolution for the EEIP. They worked with a lot of the people on the CSO program that was coming into the city. That was kind of what it was designed for originally, um, Clean Solutions Omaha, so all of the sewer separation stuff. So you've got construction, you've got engineering, so it was big. Um, they decided that the city should still take a stance to try and help direct a program that was race and gender neutral so that they could provide the opportunities based on specific data that says, okay, poverty's high here, you need the most opportunity exposure to be able to get out of poverty. I mean, that's what it's yes. supposed to do is alleviate it. Um, through those first couple of years, it was kind of a, well, we encourage you, you know, like it was still part of the contracts, like we explained earlier, the bigger ones, mm -hmm. but it didn't have the teeth to enforce as much. Um, and then in 20, what was it, it would have been a year ago, so 2021, um, the ordinance was passed to make the EIP an actual ordinance with penalties, with some structured specific rules um, of how it should be developed. Um, you know, the 500,000 threshold, those types of things. Um, in combination with that, they have the contractor provisions ordinance. So those two ordinances work hand in hand. They're triggered by the same thresholds for projects, but the contractor provisions um, ordinance is where the apprenticeship incentive lies, for example. Right. But if you, have a, if you have a project that is over 500,000, you're gonna have to do both, no matter what. So the EIP helps to enforce the contractor provisions ordinance. So like the apprenticeship falls into the workforce piece on the EIP plan for a company. Um, the SEB part has always been there, but the contractor provisions ordinance, for example, requires proof of payment that you're paying all of your people in check or direct deposit. 
there's a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot, there are always bad actors mm -hmm. in the construction industry that will choose to pay under the table right. to avoid some things. <clears throat> so this was just an effort to kind of mitigate that. Um, some of the Nebraska Employment Classification Act stuff, just saying we're going to be fair in hiring, we're going to look at you and actually give you a chance, not just say we will. Um, those can all be enforced via the EIP plan. They can be addressed in there, they can be updated quarterly on. Um, so now, 2015 to now, we finally have an ordinance, we have another kind of um, cooperative ordinance that goes with it, and the apprenticeship incentive is going to be kind of the focus of where I'm going to push the hardest um, to encourage companies to adopt. Um, there's nothing saying a company that has an apprenticeship program has to use it all the time. That's the sure. benefit. They have it for when they have the right candidate or the right applicant to put through there. Um, they, they control how they're going to utilize it. They just don't control what happens once they're in the program. So with the new construction craft worker registered apprenticeship, um, there's another one coming from a company in October that is going to adopt it. And these are some bigger companies. They get some larger contracts. They have lots of subcontractors they work with. Um, they're very connected to some of the tier one communities where they are located. It is going to hopefully gather steam and we can take it from just an incentive on contracts to a more of a, like a standardized, unsaid standardized approach to workforce development. The career fairs still are okay, right. but lots of companies and firms are just, they don't get the same responses, especially since COVID. Sure. People just, and during COVID, didn't want to show up and couldn't show up. Right. Um, and doing it over Zoom doesn't really work. Yeah. And if Definitely. you're in the construction industry, yeah, right. you got to see somebody <laughs> yeah. do the work right. to know that they can do it. So this type of model, again, is going to allow the, the employer to also have higher quality candidates as well, hopefully. So that's where we're at now. That sounds great. You've done a lot of work, it sounds like, in the program and um, really developing it. Uh, one thing I did want to ask you is, uh, you know, are there any like success stories that you can think of, either from companies or individuals? Yeah. So a couple. So the same company that had been starting kind of what we looked at as quality youth apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship programs, um, we've been working on that. And there's a lot of regulations with wage and hour that are prohibitive on age. Um, for construction sites, but they were able to kind of develop a student learner program through lots of conversations with their corporate counsel and everything. We, the legal stuff. You can have a student learner program and you can do a lot of the book stuff mm -hmm. that they're already teaching as curriculum in the schools. And at Metro, for example, is another big partner um, for the trades. They can utilize some of that stuff that they're doing towards the registered apprenticeship. So if you get started as a junior in high school, you can get two years of the four-year registered apprenticeship done, and then you can focus pretty much entirely on the actual machine and day-to-day -day labor work and drafting and management stuff once you're on the job sites, when you're 18, when you're allowed to be fully on the job site. Um, yeah. So they took some kids uh, from Omaha South, mm -hmm. and they gave them the opportunity to work with them over the summers, over their breaks, um, help encourage them through the construction program, through the career center, getting the basic foundations mm -hmm. of what it means to work in construction. And when they turned 18, they hired them full time. So they were, they were earning over a couple of weeks, you know, summer break stuff, but it wasn't full time. Yet. Sure. When they graduated, they were automatically pretty much put into full time work. Um, that company offers, you know, really good benefits. There's a, a pension health care for wow. them and their entire family that's wow. paid for. That's awesome. um, so those kids, we're 18 when they started, and it's been about two years now. So they're 20, so they would be done with their apprenticeship stuff. They're making, you know, 35, 36 dollars an hour oh by now. That's, that's a great. that's a really big opportunity for some kids that came from an area that was, and, and their family, you know, met the poverty level mm -hmm. requirements. So they have gone above and beyond that, and they're flourishing and they're, they're moving up in the company. So that's a really big success thing. That's really cool. The, that same company is the one that has adopted the construction craft worker um, registered apprenticeship. The governor just did the signing ceremony last week. It's, it's gonna be a big thing, I think, um, to kind of reinforce what they're already doing because now they have the youth and they have the formal piece and they can connect them. Um, there's a lot of success stories. I mean, just generally speaking, coming from the resolution for the EIP, 
to where it's at with the ordinance kind of enforcing it. The, just the quality of what the companies present, just overall, um, they've really started to really, I don't know if they just adopt it because they see it as beneficial for them, which it is yeah. in a lot of ways, but it's also um, makes an impact in the areas that they didn't think that there were opportunities to find. And they're still yes. working through that, but they've had enough you know, rock stars come from the areas that they're, oh, well, maybe we have some, some better opportunities here. We can kind of redirect our focus in two spots as opposed to just one over here. Absolutely, right, so, yeah. Success-wise, just the quality that's presented and turned in by the companies has gone way up. That's and awesome. It's backed by data. I mean, there's metrics that you can measure their dollars with the subs. You can see how many hours are actually putting towards volunteering, but not just volunteering. Like, what did they actually do? What did the students say? You know, yeah. your volunteering is doing for them. And then kids like the ones from South that got the job opportunity to come work. That's the ultimate. Yeah, you know, and for goal. other kids to see that, yeah, students that to they see can do that. It, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully there'll be more success stories to come. I'm sure there will be. I hope so. <laughs> and you can tell you're so passionate about your job. What would you say is the most rewarding part? Most rewarding part? I love the difficult companies that fight me. <laughs> <laughs> and don't want to yes, put I the can. plan together <laughs> and they get really frustrated and maybe their contract gets held up and they're, they're running out of time before the project starts and it finally clicks with them. I'll go meet with them and they're like, well, you're right, this, this is kind of a good thing. And they're like, you know what, we're kind of doing some things already with those count and most times they will. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, okay, well, our company culture is this. Why don't we just put it on paper and just expand upon it? Um, the most rewarding part is seeing a company that turns in a really poorly designed EEIP plan, but then works with me and they come back and it's sometimes the best ones, you know, every quarter they'll have so much detail that it takes a long time to go through and identify everything that they've been doing. And their presence in the, in the construction industry or the engineering industry gets noticed. I've had lots of companies um, say, well, what are they doing? Or I heard that this company is doing this. Can we duplicate that? Can we wow. do it? So those are really rewarding to see the companies that struggle, succeed, and then from my perspective, fully adopt it and embrace it and actually want to do it. There's a couple companies that um, continue their EIP plans every year because they mm -hmm. last for a year at a time, even when they don't have a city project that requires it. They've just yeah. decided well, this is good for us. It's done great things. We're gonna keep it going, and we know that eventually we're gonna bid on a city project again anyways, so we'll have it ready to go. So that's, that's awesome. Great. Well, I think we're about out of time for today, but thank you again so much yeah. for being here today. It was really cool hearing everything about your program and everything you're doing for the city. So great job and great well, thank work. Thank you. Yeah, great Thanks work. Thanks for having me, I yes. appreciate it. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and thank you uh, for joining us today. Please be sure to tune in again next month uh, once again, if you believe you've been discriminated against, please contact our office at 402-444-5055, or you can visit our website at, at humanrights.cityofomaha.org. I'm Laura Aite. And I'm Lori O'Brien, and this is Keep Moving Forward.